Great. Well, thank you, Pastor Betsy. It really is a blessing to be here with you all this morning to speak to you and to our graduates. Um, in light of this scripture passage, I want to begin by asking a question. Have you ever run a race before? see a, a couple heads nodding. So maybe the, the better question is, when was the last time you ran a race? Uh, for, for those of you who have run like the long distance races, I'm talking about the marathons and the half marathons, more power to you. So much credit goes to you. You know, my wife, Sarah, she uh, ran the half marathon, the Pittsburgh half marathon, which is 13.1 miles. And I had the opportunity to watch her as, you know, as I was walking around the city of Pittsburgh. And, I mean, I watched her, and it's just like nothing phased her. She's just running. She's this huge smile on her face, like not even tired. Meanwhile, then there's me. I'm just walking around the city trying to watch her. And at one point, I had to just like, whoo, catch my breath, because I was just walking for like a mile or two. And she's there, 13.1 miles. She's like not a care in the world. You know, the last uh, organized race that I ran, and no, I don't count youth group games as organized races, but the last time I ran an organized race was in eighth grade, and I was on the track team, and probably some of the seniors here are already laughing because picturing me on the track team is probably a pretty funny image, but I used to run hurdles in eighth grade, and believe me, I was not the best hurdler by any stretch of the imagination. But I also wasn't the worst. I feel like I was kind of in the middle somewhere. And uh, I remember this one race very vividly because it was the last race of the year. And it turned out it was the last race I would ever run again. And uh, so, you know, I get, get my starting blocks and, and the guy shoots the gun and, and we're off. And so I get to the first hurdle and like any good pro hurdler, I stumbled over it. And uh, lost a little bit of ground, but I kept on going, right? Because it's just the first hurdle. Till I got to the second hurdle. And every hurdler's worst nightmare happens. I did a little more than just stumble. I flat out tripped over the hurdle, like face meets the track, and I just started tumbling on the track. And I'm just like sitting there, what felt like an eternity. And I knew that I was faced with two options. First one was I could just stand up, walk off, and call it a race, and call it a career. Or I could get back up and just keep going, go to the next hurdle. And, you know, I got this, like, adrenaline a rush, like something inside of me just, like, forced me to my feet. And I ran, and I went to the next hurdle, and I jumped over it. And I ran faster and hurdled better than I ever had in my, my entire track career. And would you know that not only did I finish the race, but I finished second place in that race. After totally, like, yeah, I mean, if anyone was stunned, it was me. I couldn't believe the fact that I even finished and then came in second. And then as I looked over to my teammates, they were all staying there like, like nobody could believe that I just finished this race in second place. Like, it was unexplainable. You know, the author of Hebrews compares our faith journey to a race. And I think if we're all being honest here, I think sometimes our faith journey sort of feels like that hurdles race. We run into things, and they knock us down, and we fall. And sometimes we roll, and it's a sight to see. You know, the, the word for race in this passage is the word, the Greek word, is the word agonia, which is where we, we get the word agony. And it means struggle. So the author of Hebrews, as he uses this metaphor race, he understands that this race sometimes is a struggle. It's hard. There are hurdles in our way. Yet we are called to persevere, to get back up, to jump over that next hurdle. This was especially the case over 2,000 years ago for an entire generation of Jewish Christians to whom this letter of Hebrews was written to. You see, because of their recent conversion from Judaism to Christianity, 
This generation of believers were facing a lot of flack for their conversion. They were being persecuted by their Jewish friends, by their Jewish families, and even by the Romans. You see, this persecution was widespread. It was physical, it was emotional, it was social, and in some cases, it was even economic. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you were a salesman at this time, and you were known for your Jewish faith. You had built a clientele based strictly on that mutual Jewish faith. And then the salesman converts to Christianity. What do you think happens to his clientele when they find out that their prized salesman is now a Christian? They go elsewhere. They find another salesman who is a, who is a Jew, and now that salesman who is now a Christian has lost his business. He has lost his faithful crowd, which means he has lost sales, which means he has lost an income, which means he has lost a way to provide for his family. And so this made it the temptation for this now Christian salesman to think about going back to Judaism. Why wouldn't you? I mean, you, you were thriving under Judaism. You were earning an income. You were supporting your family. And now they were thinking about going back to their roots, back to what was comfortable, back to what was working. You see, it was persecution like this that caused an entire generation to consider walking away from their faith, and many of them actually did. Sadly, this Jewish Christian generation over 2,000 years ago is not the only generation to be marked by an exodus from their faith. In 2004, the Fuller Youth Institute did a study where they found that roughly 50% of graduating seniors will walk away from their faith. Related to that, a project named the College Transition Project, which was part of the Fuller Youth Institute, they did a longitudinal study, which meant they followed these students for years through high school and into college. And they asked them the question, what does it mean to be a Christian? Would you know that 35% of them did not even mention the name Jesus Christ. And then most recently in 2009, the Barna Group did a study and found that nearly 59% of our young generation of believers who grew up in the church like this one will end up walking away from their faith. And they also found that the Unchurched Millennials Group had grown from 44% to 52%. So just like this Jewish Christian generation from 2,000 years ago, we have a generation of young believers who are walking away from their faith. They are exiting the race early with a limp. They are hurt and they are not returning. So my question for us this morning as a family of faith and a body of believers, is how do we encourage this young generation who's walking away from their faith? How do we encourage them to persevere in this race of faith? How do we come alongside of our seniors as they run this race? And you know, I want to clarify. I know, you know today, this morning, is an opportunity to honor our, our graduating seniors, and I certainly want to do that. But I want to make sure I'm not... Uh, restricting it just to that class. When I say seniors, I'm talking about senior citizens, senior executives, senior managers, up-and-coming seniors. In fact, even if your name has the word senior in it, this message is for you. This is for all of us. Because the reality is we're all running this race of faith together. We are a family of faith. So how do we persevere? How do we persevere in this race of faith? Hebrews 12.1 says this, Therefore, since we, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. You see, that word therefore is a reference to the chapter before Hebrews 12, which would be Hebrews 11, which is known as the Faith Hall of Fame. It lists all of our champions and forefathers of the faith, those who have gone before us and have lived exemplary lives of faith. 
They are our cloud of witnesses. And they include such champions as Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Jacob and Joseph and Moses, and the list goes on and on. Hebrews 11, verse 13, says this about these champions. It says, all of these people were still living by faith when they died. So in other words, these people have run the race well. But not only have they run the race well, they have finished well. And so we should be encouraged by their stories, which are all marked out in Holy Scripture. They are examples for us to live by, and so we should be encouraged by our past cloud of witnesses. But you see, this cloud of witnesses is not just a reference to the past, those who have gone before us, but I think it's also a reference to the here and now, to the present cloud of witnesses. And for our senior graduates, you know, this could be uh, your parents, this could be your mentors, your friends, your, your older siblings, and you know, maybe, maybe even your youth pastor, those who hopefully have set an example for you to live by. So I just encourage you, you know, continue to, to look to them as an example for us all to look at our cloud of witnesses in the here and now as an example for us to live by. Ask them questions. Don't be afraid to go up to them and to ask them questions because they are a reminder that you don't run this race alone. We're all in this race together. You see, the cloud of witnesses is not just a reference to the past or to the present, but it's also a reference, I think, to the future, to those whom God will put in place in your life to be a witness to his truth. It points to a future community for our graduating seniors. Because we hope that that here at Memorial Park that you have felt loved and encouraged and supported. But we encourage you now, as you go into this next chapter of life, to seek out community. For some of you you who are going to college, it might be seeking out a campus ministry like the CCO, the Coalition for Christian Outreach. Or maybe for some of you, it's for plugging into a local church. We encourage that. You need to be supported. For some of you, maybe it's just joining another Christian organization on your college campus or wherever you may be. For the rest of our seniors out there, you know, if you call Memorial Park Church home, we hope that you have found community here. And if you haven't, we encourage you to join a new life group. Or be a part of the women's or men's ministry that we have here at the church. There's so much good going on here. And we want you to be part of it because we all need that reminder that we don't run this race alone. Because it is so important to be part of a Christian community. Because not only does Christian community strengthen us and encourage us, it comforts us. It comforts us to know that there are other people out there running this race with us going through similar, maybe similar hurdles that we have gone through or are going through. You know, I mentioned before that my wife, Sarah, had run the Pittsburgh Half Marathon. And, you know, she didn't do that alone. Uh, She actually ran it with a friend of hers, and they did all the training and everything beforehand, and then they they stuck with each other as they ran the race together. Um, And I'm sure either one of them will tell you that it didn't make the race easier per se, but I know that they will tell you that it was a comfort to have the other one there with them because they knew that whatever they were feeling, the other one was feeling it too. The tiredness, the out of breath, the, the, the racing heartbeat, the soreness probably the next day. They went through that together. It was a comfort to know that they had each other. And it's the same for us as we run this race. We need each other. And most importantly, community points us to Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so in addition to needing community in order to persevere in this race, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus and not on the culture that surrounds us. You see, I, I think the author of Hebrews tells us this because he or she understands how tempting it is to keep our eyes on ourselves, to keep our eyes on our situations and our experiences. You know, especially for our graduating seniors, you you are about to embark on a very exciting new chapter in your life, filled with, with new experiences, 
new people, new situations, and maybe even a new culture. But with all those things, I believe, comes also the temptation to keep our eyes on new temptations. Again, some of you going to college, it's going to be tempting to maybe keep your eyes on things like, like the party scene at college, or, or drinking, or getting caught up in unhealthy relationships, or even for some of you, keeping your eyes solely on your schoolwork. Because you see, these are all new things for you as you go on into this next chapter of life. These can all become hurdles in your race. But what I want to ask you this morning is this. What if you were able to view those experiences and those new situations with the eyes of faith? What if you were to see these new experiences as opportunities rather than things that could serve as a death blow to your faith? What if you could see these experiences with the eyes of faith? Here's an example. You know, like I said, most of you who, who are going to college, a lot of you are going to find out that the party scene is kind of the norm at college and that you're going to be expected, certainly not by us, but by others, to partake in that. You'll be expected to be part of it. You will have people who will pressure you into doing and joining those parties and turning to things like alcohol for comfort. But I want to remind you of something. That typically, those people who are pressuring you into doing those things and to going to those parties and to trying out and drinking alcohol, those are the people who are most desperate for acceptance, most desperate to be affirmed in some way. What if I told you, though, what if you realized, though, that you had the one thing that quenches that need for acceptance, that quenches that need to be affirmed. And that's the good news of the gospel. Because you see, the gospel accepts us as we are. The gospel affirms us as we are. And whether you share that with someone vocally or you just show them, to that, show them that the way that you live your life, you have something that they need. And that's the gospel. What if instead of getting caught up in toxic and unhealthy relationships, what if instead you sought out a community that encouraged you, supported you, strengthened you, challenged you, and even pointed you to something bigger than yourself? And that's the God who made you and created you. What if instead of stressing out with your studies and your work. And we hope that you will study hard and work hard. But what if instead of getting stressed out and being bogged down by your schoolwork, what if instead you saw it as an opportunity to join in God's work and redeeming the entire world? Rather than just seeing it as, as a paper that needs to be written or a book that needs to be read, you saw it as a way to join God and what he's doing in this world. You know, we, we take our seniors to, to this conference called the Jubilee Conference, which is actually a conference for college students. Um, and so that's something you guys can continue to go to because they talk about that exact same thing is whatever you study and whatever you work at, it's an opportunity to join God in his work and what he's doing in the world. And so all of us, all of us seniors, I think need to be reminded of something, is that we are not called to be transformed by the culture, but instead we are called to transform the culture. With this in mind, seniors, I pray that you would see this new chapter of your life with a clean slate. Because no matter how you've dealt with those things in the past, today you have the opportunity to, to hit the reset button, to start anew to not be weighed down by any baggage or reputations or cliques or anything like that. You have a chance to start new with your eyes set on Jesus. Because you see, when our eyes are on ourselves and on our new experiences and, and, and our new situations and the culture around us, when our eyes are on those things, sin is a natural consequence. But when your eyes are fixed on Jesus transformation is the natural consequence. Transformation in yourself, transformation in the people around you. It 
starts with your eyes on Him. And that means just, you know, being faithful and reading your Bible, praying, talking to God, joining that community of believers, keeping your eyes on Him. I had somebody share a devotion with me this week, and I really liked what this person said about this idea of keeping our eyes on Jesus. They were talking about how it's sort of similar to driving, and that when you when you're steering, you're steering to where you're staring. So wherever you're staring is where you're steering. So I want you to remind that as you run this race of faith, that you will steer where you stare. You will steer where you stare. You see, not only do you need community in order to persevere in this race, and not only do you need to keep your eyes on Jesus, but this morning I want to challenge us to take that a step, a step further. And I want to encourage you to to rely and depend on Jesus. We need to trust Jesus. We need to trust in who he says that he is and depend on his power to run this race. Because if you haven't figured it out yet, we can't run this race based strictly on our own abilities, on our own gifts, on our own talents. We can't. We can't do that. The scriptures say that Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And even as I was reading that this week, I asked myself, well, what does that mean? That Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And here's my best stab at it. Jesus is the author of our faith. It means that Jesus is the creator of our faith. That our faith starts with him. Our faith originates with Jesus. And, you know, again, especially for those of our graduates who are going on to college, into that next chapter of your life, you're going to read and be pummeled by books that are written by authors who don't necessarily believe the same thing that you do or come from the same perspective that you do. And, and while it's good to be challenged by people who believe things that, that are different from you, I want to encourage you to not let those readings take priority over your reading of Scripture, your reading of God's Word. And and here's why. Because God's Word is the foundation through which we see everything else in this world. God's Word is the lens through which we view the world. And that includes our studies. That includes things like, like biology and chemistry, engineering, business, philosophy, All of those things are seen through the lens of Holy Scripture. So I just encourage you graduates and the rest of our seniors here, stay in God's Word because it is the foundation through which we see and view everything else. So so Jesus is the author of our faith, and he's also the perfecter of our faith. You know, many of our Graduates here, I'm, I'm sure that many of you have probably never gotten anything lower than like a B minus in your classes. There are probably some of you who, who haven't heard the words, I'm sorry, you didn't make this team. Or I'm sorry, you didn't make this honorary. Or, or I'm sorry, you didn't quite make it. You see, if you haven't again already, I know you probably will feel this as you go on to the next chapter of life. Sometimes you feel like you need to get it all right all the time. But I want you to hear this this morning, graduates. You are not called to be perfect. You are not called to be perfect. There was one person who was called to be perfect who walked on this earth. His name was Jesus. So I want you to hear this. You're not called to be perfect. So why don't we just let Jesus be the perfect one? And let's rely on his perfect power because we certainly aren't perfect by ourselves. You know, Hebrews 12.3 says this. It says, Consider him, Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinful men that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You see, we can rely and depend on Jesus because he is perfect, but that's not the only reason. The other reason is this, is Jesus experienced everything that we have experienced. I don't know if you've realized this, but Jesus has also run the race. Jesus has had to jump past hurdles 
And in some cases, far harder than we have. So we can rely on him because he gets it. He's run this race. He has had to jump hurdles. And he's done it well. So we can rely and depend on him because he's already done it. He's already run this race. And he alone gives us the strength and the courage in order to persevere in this race of faith. I don't think anybody demonstrates this lesson better than a man by the name of Joshua. Now, I sort of feel bad for Joshua because, you know, in Hebrews 11, I said that was the Faith Hall of Fame. So if you were someone, you were mentioned in that, in that chapter. And even though the, the city of Jericho is mentioned, which was the city whose walls fell down while Joshua was the leader after they marched around it seven times, there is nothing specifically said about Joshua in Hebrews 11. So I sort of feel like he got snubbed a little bit from the Faith Hall of Fame. Um, but regardless, I think he teaches us one of the most important lessons about running this race with strength and with courage. You see, Joshua was called to lead the nation of Israel, and he was called to lead them into the promised land. Except there was one big thing standing in their way. These nations, strong army nations, who was defending the promised land. Talk about a big hurdle that Joshua had to get over. All these surrounding nations guarding the promised land. But yet we're told in Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, to be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified and do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God goes with you wherever you go. You see, if you're a good Christian, you have a life verse, right? You have a verse that you always point back to, right? When you share your testimony, you always go, you have like your go-to verse. And for me, this verse is my life verse. Because you see, you see, even in my young life, I've had a lot of hurdles. And a lot of them have pertained to my health. I've had a lot of obstacles that I've had to get over. And when I think about those hard times, I always think about my mom, who would always remind me of this promise to be strong and to be courageous. Before every doctor's appointment, she would remind me, be strong and be courageous. But every time we got a set of bad news, be strong and be courageous. Before every surgery that I had, be strong and be courageous. When we weren't sure what the next step was or, or what the next thing was to do, there she was. Be strong and be courageous. You see, Joshua ran his race with strength and courage. It wasn't because of what he did or who he was. It's because of who God is. I didn't run the race uh, through those hurdles in my life because of anything I did or because of who I am, but because of who God is. And so, graduates, I want to leave you with this. You will run the race. You will persevere but it will not be because of who you are. It'll be because of who God is. Because he goes with you wherever you go. And that's for all of us. Because all of us have hurdles, right? All of us have hard things. Big or small, they're there. And sometimes, just like in my race, we fall. And we fall hard. And sometimes we might even tumble a little bit. But just like the race, we're also faced with two options. Option one, we can just get up and walk off, call it a race. Or we can get up, go to the next hurdle, and go over it. Because you've got a cloud of witnesses that is behind you, cheering you on, encouraging you. You've got a Savior who gives you a new start each and every day. And you've got a God who gives you and provides you with the strength and courage needed to persevere in this race. So how will you respond, graduates, seniors, everywhere? How will you respond? 
Will you persevere? Will you get up and go and jump over that next hurdle? And my prayer is that you will allow the strength and the courage and the perseverance that only comes from the Lord to push you forward in this race. So that at the end of the race, when you hit that finish line, you will be able to confidently claim through faith, as the Apostle Paul said to his brother Timothy, that I fought the fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith.